Great, thanks. Well, I am uh, very glad to be here and particularly excited to launch us on the maiden voyage of presenting this uh, new paper um, about identifying um, consumption and investment, namely spending responses uh, to an exogenous liquidity shock. Um, I, I hope this fits um, reasonably well with uh, a lot of the discussions we've had uh, already today, starting with uh, Chris Carroll's um, uh, very first remarks. There have been many comments uh, about the value of collecting uh, additional data um, on spending, in particular, uh, more granular and higher frequency data. This paper is meant to um, sort of add additional substantive uh, motivation, um, highlighting the value uh, of such data. And it's also a methodological paper um, about uh, uh, testing out and comparing different approaches of how you might go about actually trying to collect such data in the trenches uh, of, uh, of household and uh, small business surveying. Um, so uh, substantively, um, this is a paper uh, about tracing the impacts of liquidity shocks on the spending decisions of households and small businesses in the setting we're dealing with in this paper. Um, those two types of agents are one and the same. All right, so these, so we're going to be talking about uh, households that operate small businesses uh, in a very closely held way. Um, being able to uh, trace uh, the spending responses uh, to liquidity shocks and to other types of shop, shocks for that matter um, has, uh, as we've been talking about all day, has implications for the theory, practice, and regulation of credit markets and for modeling intertemporal choice. Uh, in various literatures and domains more generally. Um, you know, among the sort of macro, you know, the, 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 the paper today is going to be extremely, extremely micro um, in terms of, you know, the li potential links and, and bridges to the macro literature. Um, you know, a among the, the, the models we have in mind are, are many of those that have already been discussed today on the impacts of leveraging up and then deleveraging in the, in the wake of credit supply shocks. Um, and so in, um, in, in, in terms of the, um, uh, our understanding of, of the work that's been done so far to trace out the spending responses and the, and, and, and the dynamics uh, of spending responses to liquidity shocks, our, our read, which you know, may, may well not be entirely complete, um, is, is that you know, most of the evidence focuses on what happens with spending several months um, or even years uh, after liquidity shocks. You know, so we're thinking of uh, uh, macro work that uses regional or aggregate data. Um, and we're also thinking of you know, the spate of uh, micro evaluations of things like microcredit expansions and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, helicopter drops of cash in the form of uh, grants to microenterprises and um, and cash transfers to poor households. Um, you know this work has uh, uh, certainly been valuable um, for understanding uh, an important subset uh, of of potential outcomes. Um, and, and the implications of spending responses um, to shocks, um, but it often leaves the mechanisms underlying any change or any path from shock to the later uh, uh, set of observed outcomes uh, and identified. Um, you know, each state of the world, uh, several months or years later, um, could be arrived at uh, via different paths or different mechanisms, and as we know, uh, different mechanisms can have substantially different welfare and policy implications, to say nothing of implications for which models explain the world best. So let me fix ideas a bit by giving you a couple of examples of what we mean by this. Um, uh, both are pretty close, close to home. Uh, the, fir the, the first one comes from uh, 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 one of Atif and, and Amir's uh, papers, and I think this is 
something that's come up in, uh, in several of their papers and several of the discussions today. So um, their 2011 AAR paper um, identifies borrowing against uh, rising home values, drives an increase in household uh, leverage, and then a subsequent increase in, uh, in, in defaults. Um, uh, and, 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 and they say, and I think this is a quote from the paper, so the, the real effects of this home equity-based borrowing are going to depend on what households do with the borrowed money. All right? And then the data they uh, have in that paper, um, they can rule out certain types of, uh, of loan uses, um, but, but they, uh, they, they can't identify um, where the money goes, what it's spent on. All right, so we see that it's, uh, it doesn't seem to be spent on new home purchases. It doesn't seem to be spent on, um, on bringing down credit card balances. The results, um, uh, of course, then uh, leave them saying, well, this suggests a high marginal private return um, to those borrowed funds. Well, what's, what sorts of spending generates that high marginal private return? All right. Um, uh, the... The, the nature of the spending probably has implications for how we think about this borrowing and how we think about the decision making of these consumers. Are they, you know, are they splurging on instantaneous consumption or on uh, on durables? Are they um, are they investing in in household goods? You know, are they are, are they investing in their existing houses or in uh, or in human capital? Are they investing in uh, closely held? Uh, small businesses, um, and you know, so getting evidence on uh, on where the money is going will help us uh, uh, better specify people's preferences, expectations, and so on um, in the models we've been talking about and deploying uh, all day. All right. Second example, even closer to home. This is sort of in line of um, in line with what we actually do. Um, uh, in this paper um, relates to uh, microcredit uh, expansions. All right, so the, tar the expansion of uh, relatively small loans targeted to relatively poor people uh, across the world, often with a focus on uh, financing and promoting uh, micro-entrepreneurship. Well, um, there's been um, uh, a spate of recent um, uh, uh, work uh, uh, um, using uh, randomized controlled trials and, and other, methods, uh, other methods to try to identify the impacts of increased access to microcredit on uh, microentrepreneurs um, and their households. And uh, in an emerging stylized fact or, or consensus from this literature, or at least part of this literature, at least part of the literature that uh, I've been playing in is that um, overall we're seeing notably um, weak, if any, effects on business growth and profitability from uh, from microcredit expansions. Okay, so the um, the 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 rhetoric and the promise of the Muhammad Yunuses of the world that expanding access to credit will um, uh, will lift poor people out of poverty through the engine of microenterprise growth does not seem to be borne out in the data, at least, you know, at least in the recent stages of the evolution and growth of the um, uh, microcredit market. All right, so, I mean, I want to be clear, this doesn't necessarily apply to earlier stages of growth and expansion of microcredit. We're talking about marginal borrowers in the mid to late 2000s, not inframarginal borrowers. But in any case, this is a pretty striking and to many um, a pretty uh, surprising um, new set of findings and emerging consensus. So why might this, why might this be? All right. And so um, there are at least three types of explanations that are relevant um, for this uh, exercise I'm about to take you through of following the money. One is that, um, well, we might just need, a, we might just need to measure impacts on on microenterprises over longer horizons, that is often cited and um, uh, and underway um, in many of these evaluations. Um, uh, uh, more more to the point for um, our purposes today, 
Um, it's possible, um, as, uh, as number two suggests, that maybe micro entrepreneurs are not actually um, investing these loans um, in, in business activities. Maybe they, um, maybe you know, their view of their highest expected private return is somewhere on the household side. So that's one possibility. So they're not, they're not succeeding in growing their businesses because they're not trying to grow their businesses. Uh, another possibility is that they are, they are in fact investing in their businesses, um, but not succeeding in growing or, or growing profitably. All right, so if, um, uh, if number two is true, um, this certainly you know, motivates us trying to delve deeper into the causes, consequences, and cures for credit constraints because it, uh, it would be consistent with there being sort of high private returns to, uh, to borrowing um, uh, on, the, on the house, household side of things. If number three is true, this, uh, uh, this, this motivates us trying to better understand um, uh, how to specify preferences and expectations in a world where we see lots and lots and lots of entrepreneurs borrowing and often borrowing pretty expensively um, uh, when their uh, expected return on that borrowing is, uh, is zero or even negative. So the upshot of these two examples um, is that tracking uh, short run uh, spending decisions and spending responses to shocks um, uh, will be useful. Um, but how do you do it? And as many folks have bemoaned today already, the requisite uh, administrative data um, is, uh, is often um, not available, although hopefully that's changing um, with, the, with Atif and Amir's efforts and the efforts of the CFPB, among others. Um, those of us who have, uh, who write and administer surveys in our normal course of research business um, know that uh, survey data uh, is not uh, without its, uh, its many warts. We need to worry about uh, measurement error and strategic reporting, um, among uh, other biases. Um, in particular, in the, um, you know, as I'll talk more about, in this case of trying to trace out the impacts of a microcredit expansion. Among the things that, that we worry about is that household balance sheets uh, can be uh, quite complex, uh, particularly when they are bundled and intermingled with microenterprise balance sheets. Uh, money is fungible. Uh, surveys can be long uh, and, and fatiguing. These can all lead to uh, errors and, and noise in our, in our survey data. Um, and there may be biases as uh, as well, um, born of strategic reporting, um, because people worry about links between surveyors and tax authorities, or surveyors and uh, and and banks that they're um, trying to borrow from or have just borrowed from, um, as well as uh, things that are um, not strategic in that sense, um, uh, but maybe strategic in a uh, in a uh, in a an internal sense or 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 social sense. So what we, uh, what we actually do here is we work with two uh, micro lenders, two banks in the Philippines, to uh, engineer uh, randomized supply shocks in micro lending. Um, these loans are targeted to micro entrepreneurs and underwritten for business investment, but not actually, um, but their disbursement and their usage um, as is typical in these markets is not actually restricted in any way. So you can think of these as being sort of nominally, uh, nominally targeted to, uh, for small business use and, uh, and underwritten um, you know, based on cash flow analysis um, of the businesses. But at the end of the day, uh, money's fungible and the borrowers are actually free to do with these loan proceeds uh, what, uh, uh, what, what, what they wish. Uh, um, they're, they're free to deploy them however however they like. Um, so following these um, randomized supply shocks, we go in with um, uh, seven, seven, seven different methods to try to figure out 
where this money is going. All right, and try to figure, try to identify the short run uh, impacts on the margin of uh, of these loans on the spending decisions um, uh, of these households. Um, the the innovations in uh, methodologically, in a nutshell, um, are that we're going to be focusing on channel factors of, uh, of who surveys these borrowers, all right, what the surveyor affiliations um, are. And we're going to compare um, sort of survey-only methods that try to directly elicit from people um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the marginal impact on their behavior by asking them questions like, what did you spend your loan on, versus um, uh, less direct survey-only methods where we basically give people the opportunity to reveal what they have spent um, money on and spent loan proceeds on in a less obtrusive way that is designed to mitigate the effects of um, strategic reporting and, and social stigma. Um, and then, so that's the second bin. And then the third bin is we'll then compare those survey-only methods to asking um, more sort of CEX um, uh, uh, type questions uh, about spending more broadly in tandem with um, using the randomization as a source of identification um, uh, for access to liquidity. Okay. Um, and so here, you know, the, uh, so this, this basically summarizes sort of methodologically everything, um, everything we did in this study. Uh, it basically, um, so the study starts with uh, mic microentrepreneurs applying for a loan at one of our, um, at one of our two partner banks. All right, they are um, uh, those who are sort of on the margin of being uh, credit worthy or not are then randomized into either being offered a loan or not offered a loan. Okay, so guys who are clearly above the bar just automatically get a loan. Guys who are way below the bar, as deemed by these banks, um, are automatically rejected. Everyone else is randomized. Um, then, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and at that point, uh, our various uh, methods of data collection uh, begin. I think I should probably, uh, so I'll, I'll start by giving you an overview of the, of the different methods. Okay, so um, we're, gonna, we're gonna start by asking direct questions on what do you plan to do with the money? And in particular, um, do you plan to use this loan for any uh, household expense or for paying down other debt? All right, so we start by asking those questions uh, on the bank application, All right? Then uh, a week after loan disbursement, we ask the same questions about what you did or what you plan to do uh, with loan proceeds um, when, uh, when the loan officer makes uh, his or her first visit to the borrower to, um, to collect the first payment on the loan. Um, then, uh, uh, then we do uh, two follow-up surveys, two weeks after random assignment and two months after random assignment, which are um, uh, which are done by independent surveyors and which include two different types of questions. One, these, uh, one, these questions on what have you spent, you know, what are the large purchases, list, list large purchases that, you, that you've made recently um, uh, for various spending categories. Um, uh, 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 other questions, uh, the other set of questions ask the same sort of direct elicitation that we ask on the bank loan application and that we had the Loan officer asks, just asking directly, have you gotten a loan recently? What did you spend the loan on? Um, did you spend any of it on uh, major household expenses or paying down debt? Um, and then finally, we use this, we use what's called a list randomization, which is an, uh, a relatively unobtrusive way of allowing people um, to reveal whether they have um, spent money on anything that might be perceived to be uh, sensitive or stigmatized or, or frowned upon by giving people, uh, by randomizing uh, lists of different spending categories, as I'll show you in a minute. Okay, so 
um, as I said, the, um, uh, we do direct elicitation by asking people directly, um, have you had a loan? What have you, uh, what have you spent it on? Um, we, um, we have bank employees um, and our independent surveyors ask these questions at different points in time. All right. The list randomization um, uh, uh, randomizes survey respondents into either getting a, uh, a list of four questions or a list of five questions, and it just asks you for a count of how many, you know, how many of these statements are true. All right, so how many of these four statements are true? How many of these, how many of these five statements are true? The fourth, uh, the four question list contains only relatively innocuous or non-controversial questions. The five question list is the potentially sensitive one. Um, in our scenario, uh, the fifth question is either this question about whether you spent uh, loan money on a household purchase or whether you spent loan money on paying down other debt. And then we can just compare at the group level, we can compare, um, uh, we can com uh, infer the proportion saying yes to the sensitive question by comparing means across the, the long list versus the short list groups. <coughs> this, these are the actual lists, which I'll skip over in the interest of time. And then in the follow-up surveys, as I said, we, um, our surveyors, ask respondents to list all transactions of 1,000 pesos, that's about 20 bucks or more, that they've made in the last two weeks or the last two months, and then list each item with the amount that's spent, no mention of a loan. And then we can use our randomization um, we can, uh, uh, to compare uh, um, the spending responses in the treatment versus um, the control group to actually identify the marginal effect of getting access to one of these microloans um, on spending. All right. So the um, so I'll summarize the key findings in the remaining time. Um, first, perhaps not surprisingly, at least to economists, although um, this might surprise other users of this sort of data, um, respondents report uh, or appear to be reporting strategically. They they report uh, almost no non-business uses of loan proceeds uh, to the banks. They report significantly more, you know, so this is when asked directly, what, do you, what are you going to or what did you spend your loan money on? They report significantly more to independent surveyors and yet significantly more than that to independently surveyors w um, through the list randomization method when they're given the opportunity to sort of report un relatively unobtrusively um, uh, how they think they've used their loan proceeds. The key finding, the second key finding, and perhaps the, the most uh, surprising substantive finding in, in this paper, is that even these more, what we might think of as more truthful survey, uh, survey responses, um, for example, to the list randomization question, don't actually identify the counterfactual that we are most interested in uh, as researchers. So the counterfactual being, you know, what did this loan allow you to spend on that you would not have in the absence of this loan, right? Um, so if we used the list randomization, again, just observational data by directly asking people in a sort of state-of-the-art way in this survey, if we use the list randomization to infer um, uh, an answer to that counterfactual, um, we, we'd infer that, uh, we might infer that 12% of the, the treatment group, uh, we might infer that there's, there's a 12% increase in, uh, in, in household consumption right, as a result of getting access to these loans. But when we look at, um, when we look at our general questions on spending and compare treatment versus control groups, we see that their spending behavior is absolutely identical. So in other words, the, um, the, the marginal effect uh, on household spending uh, uh, turns out to be zero. So where does the money go? Um, it turns out that the money, uh, uh, turns out that the money um, actually does go to business inventory, right? And so this is 
uh, 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 somewhat surprising given prior findings of, uh, of lack of effects of microcredit expansions on business growth and profitability. Um, so uh, in both the, the two-week and the, 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 the two-month follow-up surveys, we can basically account for um, all of the loan proceeds um, uh, uh, by, through, uh, through effects on business inventory. All right? And we also look at other types of business investment and, um, and, uh, and many types of, uh, of course, many types of household spending um, and, uh, and, and debt reduction as well. Everything seems to be going to business inventory. All right? And so it will be interesting and important uh, to do yet more follow-up surveys on this population um, to see whether this initial increase in business inventory translates into longer run business growth and profitability. In this case, what we're able to say is that any lack of effects on business growth and profitability are not going to be for lack of trying. All right? The money does seem to be going to business investment. So just summing up, um, so this paper is just meant to be um, sort of a, a, a demonstration or, or, or a pilot of these different methods for uh, motivating and, and, and illustrating uh, that short-run high-frequency data can be useful in tracing and, uh, and interpreting household responses to liquidity shocks. Um, and ultimately, we hope useful for uh, teasing apart you know, some of the trillion dollar questions we've been wrestling with today, which is, you know, are, are people borrowing too much? Is, cre is, is, is credit um, too readily available or, 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 or not readily available enough? If people are over borrowing in a sense, um, what is leading them to over borrow, at least in the proximate sense of what are they over borrowing on? Um, and, um, and, and we hope that researchers will take, uh, uh, take the methods um, that we've used in this paper um, and begin to, to run with them. Um, certainly one thing that we're now um, thinking about for the first time um, is, uh, is tweaking uh, some of these survey questions in ways that um, might allow direct survey elicitation uh, to better get um, at this counterfactual that we think in this paper we're only able to get at through the combination of random assignment and fairly detailed uh, and expensive surveying. But we're certainly interested in, um, in testing the possibility that maybe asking people directly, what did you spend your loan on that you would not have bought if you had not gotten them the loan? In other words, actually walking people through the counterfactual um, might produce uh, equally valid and, and useful results going forward. Very much. The floor is open. The, um, one of the countries that you might want to take a look at is um, in Israel. They make these micro loans, um, and, and they've been doing it for about 10 years. And uh, they say their default rates are very low, and that the, a lot of the, the money either given to Israeli Jews or Arab, Arab, Israeli Arabs goes, at, at least the anecdotal data that they tell potential donors <laughs> Is that it actually go into these small businesses? I don't, you know. So that's another place that, you know, Israel in many ways is a microcosm of the macrocosm. So maybe that they might be interesting. The second thing is there's an organization by the name of CFED, which targets small. It's run by a former um, classmate of mine, Andrea Levere, and they and they um, they they target loans to uh, very poor communities for business purposes. And they've been doing it for, for many, many years. And there may be some data in that. Because their purpose is to really track whether the money is being used um, in a productive way, whether the borrowing is being used in a productive way. So, yeah, um, so to your point about Israel, um, I mean, just to give a, a quick plug, there will soon be a, a special issue um, in uh, AJ Applied that takes. I think it's five, 
five or six studies of the impact of microcredit expansions on microentrepreneurs and their households in different settings from all across the world, um, from Mexico to Bosnia to um, many places in between. Um, and so when I, you know, when I was speaking of sort of the emerging consensus that there is a surprising lack of evidence that businesses uh, transform themselves following uh, obtaining greater access to, to credit, contrary to a lot of the rhetoric, that's, the, that's, uh, that, that's uh, among the studies that I'm referring to. Um, to your point about CFED, I mean, I think one of the many factors it does not include Israel. Yeah. Um, uh, um, to your point about CFED, I mean, I think one of the, you know, w one of the many factors that motivates this sort of work and, and the work that we're all doing here is that efforts to um, continue to expand access to small dollar loans, um, both for uh, entrepreneurship and for, um, and for consumer borrowing, um, continue apace all over the world, including in the U.S., um, uh, including the U.S. on the micro side, um, on the micro lending side. Um, so. Other point in terms of cross-disciplinary work in this area, uh, to the uh, um, uh, Andrea at CFED told me that one of the air, air ways that they're trying to improve the effectiveness of whatever loans they're making in the programs was to rely on sort of design thinking and behavioral financial ish implications of trying to to nudge people to make better decisions as to how to use the money in right. terms of the name, the way they communicate, the way they follow up. So there's, there's a design element to some of these programs. So if they improve in the way they're constructed, maybe you'll get different results. I'm not saying you will, right. but anyway. One of the stylized facts that I used to hear, it may not even be uh, accepted anymore, is that there's a very great difference in micro-lending activities and their success, depending on whether the clientele are primarily men or primarily women, with working much more successfully with women as the clients. Uh, did you look at gender at all in this? And I'd be just interested in terms of responses to surveys and so forth, whether any of these differences showed up. So in, uh, so in the paper today, the lenders are, um, are, are not targeting women, which is a bit unusual in the microcredit world. Um, typically, um, you know, if you look across the world, I think the mode is micro lenders do target women for, for various reasons. Having said that, in the study today, it turns out that over 80% of borrowers end up being women because women, it turns out that in the Philippines, um, women tend to own the types of small businesses that these lenders end up targeting. So we have mostly women in our, um, in our sample. Um, and um, so I, uh, um, more broadly, I think most of, the, most of the work that has you know, done a decent job of trying to answer this question of you know, what are the downstream effects of, of microcredit on borrowers and businesses has studied um, lenders that, uh, that target women. That's a mode. I thought some of this literature was trying to directly measure the sort of the marginal product of capital for these, for these micro enterprises. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, there's a second literature which kind of tries to measure the actual cost of dispersing these loans, and the typical finding is they're very large, so you need to actually have very significantly large interest rates to break even, which, which suggests that for this thing to be sustainable, they need to have very high uh, rates of uh, return. Uh, if you just look at those numbers, they sound um, sort right, of uh, so unreal, right, that there's so no uh, way they can have these high yeah, rates? Yeah, so let me, again, tackle this in two ways. First, by sort of starting with our setting from this study and then zooming out to what we are seeing in microcredit and microentrepreneurship micro more broadly across the world. Um, in, our, in our setting, um, the loans uh, cost about 60% APR. And so, you know, uh, 
so we can infer if we believe you know if, if we believe our results we can infer that the uh, the entrepreneurs in in our setting in this study um, perceive their marginal return uh, to be strictly greater than sixty percent right and in most models right well but th and this is a puzzle so let's zoom out. so now let's zoom out more broadly all right so more, more broadly, we have this sort of growing body of evidence suggests that, suggesting that people are not growing out even when they're given access to microloans, which are sometimes often expensive. On the other hand, we have this growing literature that's trying to measure the marginal product of capital through various methods, including just dropping money on people and seeing what happens. This is David McKenzie and co-authors' work. Some of that... Um, some of that evidence suggests that marginal returns of capital are quite high in the, in the triple digits and, um, and certainly high enough to justify borrowing at market rates for microcredit. And so, again, we, you know, so, so the, puzzle, the puzzle deepens then, right? Because if we have high marginal returns to capital and we have more widely available credit, why aren't we seeing the businesses growing? We don't know yet. Increased inventory investment, do, do you have an idea of, of why it is being held? Is it out and running out of material or to expand the scale of production, in which case we, we should see? We, so, um, oh, sorry, yeah. All right, so the question is why, um, why increase uh, inventory um, uh, in, 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 the, in the setting for this paper? Um, uh, I can... I can speculate based on what I've seen descriptively. We haven't tried to, to, to answer this question directly. Um, about half of the businesses in our, um, in our sample are small convenience stores. Um, and so I would, I would speculate that they're adding inventory in an, in, in an attempt to in, increase their scale rather than, um, rather than for insurance motives, but we haven't asked about that directly. Scale increase then? Uh, well, we'll so we're we're collecting yet more more data. So now we'll be at a year or two post random assignment, and so we'll um, and so we'll be able to to see whether this has translated into a long run effect on scale and profitability. Um, there's sort of an implicit motivation for uh, almost for I think all of the whole microcredit um, the miracle of microcredit um, arguments the motivation uh, seems to be that there there must be some interpretation of behavior of the behavior that we see other than that people are behaving in and a way that reflects a very high degree of impatience. Um, I think maybe it's time to give up on that implicit motivation. Um, whether the high degree of impatience uh, reflects, you know, geometric discounting at a time preference factor of, you know, 0.7, or whether it's a beta delta type of thing. In either case, uh, I think the behavior that that existed and that motivated all of the microcredit stuff is an equilibrium for people who have preferences like that. So maybe the only, um, maybe maybe it, the future generations of microcredit uh, initiatives ought to just see if there's a way you can change people's preferences. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, I hope I understand your point correctly, but let me sort of, flip the motivation around a little bit. I mean, I, I think this further makes the point of why it's valuable to try to follow where the money goes, right? So um, to me, it does not, you know, um, you know to me, the fact that we see all the money going to business inventory is, um, is, is, is not terribly consistent with the world where this pool of borrowers or potentially borrowers are um, are impatient or, or impulsive guys, 
All right? And so I think we've already, we've already learned something and already learned something surprising um, about, um, uh, about the decision making um, of these borrowers and what they're at least trying to do um, to improve their, their lots. I would not have been surprised in this setting to find that most of the loan proceeds went to household consumption, for example, based on, you know, based on previous findings. Um, but that's, that's not what we found, and, and, and we may be equally surprised in, in, in what we eventually find with respect to, you know, where all the uh, home equity extraction went in terms of what people actually spent their money on. I agree. Totally. Oh, <clears throat> sorry about that. Just to follow up on Chris's comment, the way that I think about the inference vis-a-vis -vis intertemporal preferences is that the borrower has an internal rate of return inside their business, which is presumably 30, 40, 50, 60 percent per year. And the fact that that return exists in equilibrium means that that's the relevant margin for them in terms of their interest rate in the Euler equation. And so by implication, we're learning about their time preferences. If when their equilibrium allocation is completed, they end up at a margin with a 50% internal rate of return. And so I do think that However they spend the money, the fact that in equilibrium, capital returns 50% in their firm implies that unless there's something extreme that just happened to them, their discount rate is approximately of that order of magnitude. So, right. So if, 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 I, under, so if I understand, let me see if I understand your, your, your point correctly. I mean, I think there are a couple of ways to come at this. One is that, you know, in equilibrium in a well-functioning market, we, you know, we'd expect the cost of borrowing to roughly e equal the, the, the marginal product of capital, right? But the, the whole... Even in, all, even in autarky, they could save. In other words, another margin that's available to them is doing a little bit less consumption over the last five years or ten years and taking advantage of these investment opportunities. And the fact that they haven't on average endogenously done that t teaches us something important about how impatient these households are or inattentive or myopic or whatever it is right. but in some sense it is what is interesting is that they haven't themselves endogenously accumulated wealth slowly over a period of time that works down that production function and thereby lowers the marginal rate of return of additional capital right right Right. Yeah, I, and I think this, right, and, and that's, I mean, that is a, a closely related piece of this puzzle. Um, you know, you know you're, you're, you're basically, you're, you're adding another piece to the puzzle of high marginal returns to capital, weak effects of expansion to, mi to, to, to microcredit. You could, you could also add just, you know, why don't we, you know, why, why haven't we seen more convergence given those, you know, that, Mar that high marginal product of capital and the increasing availability of credit. So I agree. Last question to Bob Hall. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, just to get the microeconomics of this right, they, we can presume that the equilibrium occurs where the marginal product of capital is equal to the marginal rate of substitution between now and the future. The problem is because they can't trade in the capital market, that, that e equilibrium occurs at a very high rate. But if the capital market pro could provide capital at a lower rate, then they would expand and achieve an equilibrium in which those two were equated at a lower rate. So. Yeah. Okay. So, but this is, but this whole microcredit idea is is trying to open up the capital market yeah. and, and achieve that benefit.
Yeah, oh, sorry, that's exactly what I said. But the problem is that that occurs at a very high rate of, of uh, marginal product recapital and marginal rate of substitution. We want to drive them both down by opening up the credit market. I mean, that's what this is all about, right? I, I, I'm sure we agree. We both have PhDs from MIT. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is just a standard Fisher diagram. You draw a line representing the ability to trade in the credit market, and that line has a lower slope than it would if you look for the tangency of the, of the uh, isoquant, present future isoquant, and present future uh, in, indifference curve. I'll, I'll draw you the picture. It's stan absolutely standard. <laughs> on, on, on that note, I think we have to conclude to, to stay on schedule. I didn't get Thank to you my very much. Mark.